Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Tiger's Talk Rugby. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank Tiger Vision for providing us with the facilities and equipment to make this possible. Uh, CJ and I have really enjoyed ourselves doing this, and we're ready to do more. On that note, uh, welcome. I'm Ethan Richards. I'm CJ Bakel. And we're your hosts. And this week we are solo. This will be our first time doing a, uh, just the two of us, but we got a great episode for you. So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun, uh, especially. It's just gonna be the two of us on 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 the mics today. So that's that's gonna be a lot different. It's gonna be a lot more of our voices in so, your face. All right, and also <laughs> again, let us know how you feel about the podcast in the comment section for Facebook. Uh, we really like to get your guys' feedback. Yeah, of and, course. Um, yeah, so let's talk about what happened this last week in the World Cup. So <clears throat> starting off the week, we had uh, Wales, Georgia. Wales had a dominating 43-13 to 13 win. Yeah, yeah, that was a, a blowout, to say the least. But, but the Georgian scrums, man. Yeah. They were, they were solid. I know Aaron Kears sent me a sent me a couple of pictures and memes about it. It was pretty funny. Yeah, they, they were dominant. Georgia Georgia is like a pack of rhinos when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to scrumming. They are insane forwards for sure. Like that's what they're that's what they're built for. It seems or just like every Georgian like man is built for this. Yeah, really. So uh, that was the first game of the week, and then Russia Samoa Samoa smacked. Russia, 30, uh, 34 to 9, and I'm actually really happy with that result. Yeah. Samoa, you know, again, Samoa has the breed, the talent, the history, and, you know, just being this rugby island nation. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not really surprised by the outcome. Um, I know Russia, to me, was absolutely the, like, least – expected to do well team in that pool yeah and and Samoa I feel like had something to prove in this match because because everybody was kind of looking at Samoa and this coming into this like oh like that's another one of the bottom teams for their pool like that won't be that they won't really matter and like I think they were just trying to show like hey we can be dominant and when we get into playing some of these harder teams as well like we can beat them you know that's what they wanted to show yeah and again, Samoa, I definitely think that they want to ma make a couple statements while they're in the World Cup. Maybe not necessarily get past into the quarterfinals, but I know they want to make some statements. Absolutely. And uh, like we said in our first episode, that you know they're very much a Samoan side, and they're very like passionate for Samoa. So it's good that they're absolutely they're doing like that. Um, now, let's come to our first upset of the tournament. This was a wild game. I watched this game. It was uh, Fiji versus Uruguay, and it was a 27 to 30 Uruguay uh, W. And this was Uruguay's first World Cup win, and it was it was a it was pretty amazing. Yeah. Because I was again watching this match. You look at the Fijians; they are insane humans. They are they must. They're huge. You look at every single player, they're huge. And then Uruguay's side is very small. You could, you could, phys like, you look at the TV and you could see that everybody on Uruguay's side is really small. But they're very, very quick. Yeah, they, which is one thing. They definitely uh, showed that they're, like, they were there for not, not to physically dominate other teams, but, but to have to work in other ways and, and stay out of the contact as, as technically as possible right. to, to really overcome some of their weaknesses as a side, really. And I think going into this game, Uruguay's either coach or defensive coach knew going in that these guys were huge and that their athletic ability is insane. Because you see a lot of these, uh, you watch the game and you see a lot of tackles are, you know, two person, three person tackles. But it was impressive to see that, you know, Uruguay would go, like, one guy would go low, one guy would go high, and they'd make the tackle, but both of them were very quick to get out and get like, back into defensive structure and roll out of those rucks. So that was pretty, 
that was probably one thing of emphasis for them. And uh, I, I just think that Fiji, again, they, it, they have a lot of sevens guys on their team. And it looked, it shows that they're trying to do the fancy offloads. They're trying to be Fiji when it comes to sevens. Yeah, and, and that strategy, like, it, it worked very well in sevens because it's much less like based on on the resets and the, and the and the consistent phase play that 15s has behind it and and I think that like they were able to do that and keep the ball flowing but as soon as the ball went down their ability to reset the ball um, was not as strong as as some of the other teams and that's why they they fell on on offensively to Uruguay yeah and I'm Uruguay, very emotional about it. I'm, I'm very happy with them. Yeah. Again, good upset. Everybody, everybody it's, loves to see that. It truly is like one of the first like, like, unexpected upsets. Of the yeah, season. that's the thing. It's I, one I, of those where you look at the schedules like, okay, you, you kind of glance over it because it's Fiji Uruguay. But then when you really, when it comes down to it, Uruguay winning, it, it means a lot to the those people. And, and like and again, those, after the like. Uruguay has a, a tough history when it comes to uh, right since they rugby, especially had with the qualified uh, like in 2015 was the first time they'd qualified since 2003. Yeah, and like and, the and plane crash as well with the Uruguayan team back like in the 70s. Like, right. I, I there's like Uruguay has a hit like has an interesting history, but I'm I'm very happy with them. Right. Yeah. Um. They, it's a tough, tough, tough thing for the uh, Fijian side. As well, um, I, I know we've been talking Fijians. about it from the uh, Uruguay side for for a while, but for Fiji, like, I'm sure that those guys, like, mentally, that game affected them. Do you? How do you think that Fiji is going to bounce back from that, if they are at all? I, I think they will. I think uh, they'll be more aggressive and more like intent to to not lose again. And it doesn't mean that I think they will win out the rest of their games, but like knowing that this was a side that everyone expected to be in, for the most part, easier win for for Fiji, like or for really anybody in their pool, and then they lose to them by three, like that's that's one of those things that I think people, I, I think Fiji will take that to heart and and will come back with more more aggression than they played with. So Fiji plays Georgia on Thursday. Yes. So I th do you think they might be able to get that win? Uh, uh, that's a tough one. Um, that's, a, that's like a that's – for, for me, I had Georgia beating both Fiji and Uruguay, and that was it for that pool. Um, I, I don't I, – I, I could see it being a very close game, but to me, I still see Georgia uh, – Coming into that game and winning, um, especially because like Georgia, I mean they they got killed by Wales and and people keep making the argument that Georgia should be in the Six Nations over Italy, like yeah and and so so for them like yes they they got creamed by Wales which is no different than really how Italy performed against Wales and Six I, Nations. I would like to see Italy play Georgia at one point. Yeah, in time. that that the last time they played was. 2018, actually. So, um, but you know, uh, and Italy did win that game. And so, then speaking of Italy, you know, Italy played Canada this last week, and they smacked them. Another, uh, you know, another one-sided victory, yeah. 48 to seven. Yeah, that's. Um, I feel like it's not surprising because Italy is still considered a tier one nation when it comes to rugby. They're still considered a high level nation yeah and and Canada is still on the developing edge and still working on getting up to that level of rugby and so uh, for most people it was a question of like how Italy performs is is what what defines Italy not defining Canada right and I think Italy so Italy and Canada like you said it, like the, the it's weird because there's such a, a an offset, I guess, or like a gap when it comes to those tier one nations and tier two nations, like Italy yeah. versus like Canada. So, 
like the talent wise. I, I don't know if it's talent, if it's know how, but it's it's kind of interesting. Um, but I, I I mean Canada. <laughs> this weird thing with Canada is like especially with the MLR now being a thing, like and that's definitely helping them develop. They have but the arrows. They always they're always comparing themselves to the United States, which is kind of weird. Because in recent, at least in recent history, the United States has dominated that rivalry. Yeah. And whenever you look at, or whenever you listen to interviews, they always say that, oh, we are catching up to the United States. And, and I think that's more of a realistic bar for them than anything else. I don't think they want to be like, oh yeah, we're catching up to Italy, or we're catching up to Scotland, you know? Because like, realistically, they're not. Realistically, the closest team to them the closer teams to them are like the United States and Tonga and that that level of rugby, like that eight, like that Asia Pacific like tournament ish, right? Like right. group, like with the, like Fiji and things, right? And that's like the level of rugby that they they're that's they're realistically to... where they want to be the top of at this current point in time. Yeah, that's where they should shoot for because if you're gonna if you're trying to say like oh yeah, we're gonna be World Cup winners in, in 2023. Like, that's not realistic. Right. They want to, they, they have, <clears throat> you, have to, you have to commit to taking each step. And, and right now that is their step. So I, like, I, I, I see why they make that comparison. It makes sense to me. Fair enough. So, uh, speaking of the United States. <laughs> I know, nice segue. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> England versus the U.S. and oh, the U.S. of A. Man. got killed. Oh, another! It was it was another blowout. It was forty-five to seven. England winning um, it, very uh, clearly. Let's uh, be honest. It should have been forty-five to nothing. Or or like yeah yeah definitely forty-five nothing. I won't say it should have been like fifty or fifty-two nothing because England how they performed in that last like minute of like standard play and then the the minute and a half extra like it was disgusting rugby like it was n nobody kept their ball like kept the ball to hand everybody was it, the ball was just getting dropped left and right and and as soon as england had that one reset where they got the ruck in and and they made the pass off the base it should have immediately been kicked out yeah it, it, the score should have been 45 nothing for england but they did get greedy they did want that 50, that big 5-0, or the 52, like, because 50, 50 to zero just sounds way more intense than 45-0, because, fi like, how we, how we think, like, 50 is a marker to us, you know? Mm, that's, I guess that's true, but... But it, they, uh, they absolutely got greedy. So, looking at an England side, I think that this, Eng that England side was phenomenal. Absolutely. George Ford, fantastic. Fantastic game. Well, game. I mean, man, he of was man of the match. Yeah, man he, of the match. I, I for sure, he, he was amazing. His kicks were on point. He was just yeah. cross field kick after cross field kick. Yeah, insanity. Like it was crazy. Like how Martin Sefo, the uh, the USA wing. You'd think that he has the athletic ability to, you know, at least go up and grab those. Which he does, but the the kicks were so well positioned that it it was. Every time it was a challenge. Yeah, and it, it, I wouldn't say it was a 50-50 ball. It was more like a 60-40 or like a 70-30 ball to whoever, in, like to the England uh, winger, yeah. which was insane. Yeah, it's, it's, it was one of those games like, like USA was getting dominated in the scrums. Like there were so many, yeah. so many just like broken scrums by the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was, it was tough to sit there and watch because like they were so powerful. Like it just and and so technically well put together on the English scrum that it just like it was it was devastating. And I think a, the, the the scrums was a big like a huge thing that definitely played a role was experience because you see Dan Cole he was he was destroying the United States uh, front row and then Absolutely. David Anu. The 19-year-old starting for the United States in like, well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because remember, he he uh, got his he hurt his ankle. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's he's now out for the rest of the tournament. Yeah, he had to fly home. And uh, Chance Wangaluski, yeah. uh, former Lindenwood player, you know, 
is now mm -hmm. now in Atlanta. Is that correct? Yeah, I think he signed with Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. So now he's, and now you know he he's going over, over into Japan to to, to be play? on the thirty one man squad. So again, like if you guys don't know, uh, Chance. You, uh, I think our freshman year, so this must have been like two years ago, yes. uh, Chance played for Lindenwood, and we played against Lindenwood in Lindenwood and at home. And he, We as in Clemson. We as in Clemson men's rugby. rugby. Clemson men's rugby played them CJ at home. CJ was playing. Yeah, so it was, pretty, it was pretty insane to play him. He's a good player, and like I could for sure say that he's a dominant front rower but for you know, college sake. So having him go over there and say, hey, you know, I played against or played against him, played with him. It's fantastic to say that, but <laughs> I. Did, but after watching this United States game, they need a lot of help. Yeah. Well, it, I it also part of it was like, like a score like this is almost expected when when territory was almost eighty percent for England. Like they they had the territory, and then ball possession was was seventy percent for England. So like. I, it, it's just like when you can't win the scrums, you, you line outs were evenly contested for the most part. Um, and, and the turnovers were just like in the 20s. Like it's just, it's tough. You, you, retaining the ball is so important to playing good rugby. And, and the United States absolutely struggled with that. What do you think is a, was a major thing that made the United States, like, why weren't they able to physically hold on to that ball? Like, what do you well, think was a major factor to that? Um, it's one, one thing, uh, maybe not just retain the ball, um, our, our ability to maul. Oh, was, yeah, mauls was, was, was upsetting, honestly, to watch. Because cause when we tried to maul against England, like, England easily tore our mauls apart. And that's why we lost ball possession. Off of line outs, off of like, like it was they they just obliterated our malls, and and then then we couldn't even defend on a mall. Like we we had uh, we easily had twenty to thirty to fifty meters lost in just from malls. And like a couple of those tries were, you know, England just kicks it to the corner, and then they just maul it over, and it's right. so easy for them. And I understand that's kind of what England English rugby is kind of known for, is like mauling it a, a lot, but or at least it was in the past. It, it has been. It's been. It, it has been like one of the things that they like to do, but still, the United States needs to. They like no know, knowing like hey, you look at the English pack and and they've got like big strong hardball carriers who will do anything to continue continue that drive. Like with Vinopola and like with Dan that you were talking about earlier, like yeah. like all these guys, like you know that they can drive you out. So you should like it should have been preparation should have been done. I don't know, obviously I don't know what that preparation that they did was, but obviously they didn't prepare well enough to to be able to contest the English mall. Do you think Gary Gold is gonna make that a uh a big like training point, at least before their next match. I, see, with their upcoming matches, I don't think. I think the English Mall um, will probably be the, the most difficult. Is is the most difficult that they have to play. I don't think France has as strong. I mean, Argentina is pretty good because they are they're very forward dominated sometimes. Right, but but. The United States probably has, what is it? It's uh, 9, 10, 11, 11 days from this point of when we're recording till they have to play uh, Argentina. Because oh. that, that game's October 9th. Right. I uh, thought you were saying till the next game. I was like, no, no, that's, they, play, that's they play France on Wednesday. Yeah, they play France on um, Wednesday. But, but, like, I don't, I don't, I, I think, yes. Uh, France will see that as a weakness and, and work on making that a, a pinpoint to, mm. to pressure. Mm. Um, but I don't see I, I don't see that being like drilled into their heads like it should have been before this game. So because there was two tries that genuinely you could say were scored off of malls in this game. That's very true. But I just have to, yeah. since I know you're um, very much an English uh, rugby fan. 
Yeah. What do you think about that hit on Owen Farrell? Ah, uh, yes. Owen, Owen Farrell. Come um, on. It was a good call. Um, I absolutely, it was, it was not legal in any form. And he definitely, it, uh, the funny moment when he tried to say, oh, he was just trying to pull out, and the ref was just like, I, I disagree. Yeah. Like, um, I side fully with the ref on that one. Um, it was just, it was a cheap shot. Uh, it was not, not in the sport. You think a little bit of frustration? Um, oh, absolutely some frustration. But um, th uh, that's not to say that I don't see Farrell as somebody who hasn't done that before. He's gotten away mm -hmm. with it multiple mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. um, the irony in it, right? Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of irony in it. But at the same time, like, like the World Cup is absolutely not the place for it. Yeah, um, on and, the biggest show in rugby. Right, like the, a lot of people watch it, and yeah. and for sure, like definitely didn't get away with it and shouldn't have gotten away with it. My last question about this game: Do you think there are any positives for the United States coming out of that? Absolutely, I think there's a lot of stuff you can learn from a loss as bad as this. Um, you don't obviously there was a lot of bad points for the U.S. in this game, like a lot of places they struggled, but. Really, what they need to do is pick a few, like the mauling, um, like like uh, catching contested cross kicks, mm. and and um, using using more possession for territory trade um, skillfully. Like uh, I think they struggled with that a little bit, and and you just focus on those for the upcoming games because obviously, like you should work on everything and you should get better at every part of the game. But like genuinely and truly, when you have a week between games, about roughly. Um, that that should definitely be a, a a focus, you know. Yeah, and again, I think Blaine Skelly said it best. Sometimes failures, you can see a lot of like good things that come out of it. And I think the United States just really need to hunker down and figure this out before uh, France and Argentina. Absolutely. But uh, next, so the next game that happened was uh, Argentina versus Tonga. Uh, Argentina won 28 to 12. As expected. As expected. Big Argentina, good team. They played solidly. I watched this game. I watched the first half of this game. It's pretty solid. Tonga have a lot of really good forwards, and they're really, really athletic, but they're really, really lazy. Yeah. And I saw that their, Tonga's forwards are really lazy, and I think that prob that might have a little bit to do, but yeah, I'm. I'm not going to say definitively. I would just genuinely, I think it comes down to Argentina being a better oh, side. Just a better side. I, I, I think I this agree game, too, like, a little bit. The mistakes, the mistakes that were made um, in this game from both sides were, were probably on par with just their, their skills. Uh, I, I think Argentina made less mistakes um, uh, and, uh, like, really were able to hold stronger um, in their own half. Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, when you watch that game, like, Tonga dominated territory. Like, they, they truly, they, like, for, for periods of time. Like, a whole, like they, they showed for, for the last 10 minutes, like, Tonga just, like, showed that they could, they could dominate and they could force it to be in the Argentinian half. But, like, when it was in the Argentinian half, they just like they performed better. Right. Like um, th that last ten minutes, like Tonga dominated territory. They dominated possession, and and they really showed that they could they could put put some stuff together against Argentina. But like defensively, Argentina just did a better job. And then. Uh South Africa, Namibia, 57 to three. South African win, another blowout. South Africa still looking good, even after their loss to New Zealand. Which I mean, that loss, like, I personally, I, I expected South Africa to win the pool. I, I felt like South Africa was coming in strong, but a loss to New Zealand, who is now back at the top of the the table for the world. Um, they're number one again after Ireland lost, and, and oh, I was we'll, going to we'll, try to say that. No, we'll we'll, that we'll get to that later. Um, but but they're now back at number one, um, and so like that nobody should ever be upset and like morally torn down from losing to the number one team in the world. 
Uh, obviously, it's frustrating, and, and you want to see your, yourselves upsetting them, especially like when South Africa realistically could. But it's one of those things. It's like, like, okay, you lost to New Zealand. Okay, let's just move on and win the rest of your games. And yeah. that's what that's what they're done. That's why that's why they beat uh, Namibia by what was it fifty four. So yeah. so like they were just they I mean just moving on to the next match. You know yeah. They, which is what they should do. So like like we're saying, moving on to the next match. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our game of the week, Australia versus Wales, came up, and uh, it was First very very weird kind of match. Uh, certainly, certainly a, a, a match that deserved to be focused on, um, especially like it, this was the battle for the top of their pool. Yeah, really. So predictably, like like what, what everybody coming in, like this was what you'd expect to decide who who's one and who's two. Um, and so, yeah, as you were saying, it was it was a odd odder match. I wouldn't say like I. Mean, yeah, I, the reason why I say that is because Wales did win 29 to 25, so the score line seems like it's a little closer, but Wales were on fire at one in point, the first half. At one point, they had, I mean, not in the first half, but at one point to, towards the beginning of the second half, they had an 18 point lead. They had an 18 point lead, but like they scored within the first 36 seconds of the game. Well, well drop goal. Yeah, drop, drop goal, goal, but still. But it, that shows that they're score. out for blood. The fact that they want they want to put points on immediately and the fact that they 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 were that aggressive to go for a drop goal immediately like that's that's just showing that they want to they wanted this game. And and Australia has been the thorn in Wales side before in the World Cup. Yeah, um, that's true. And, that's very and, true. And so like for the fact that that they were able to beat the Aussies this time around, like shows how much they really want this one. So, one of the I think a great a one thing that from Wales that was an emphasis, I guess, for them was just to put points on the board because they had a total of nineteen points between Dan Bigger and Reese Patchell came from their foot. So yeah. Dan Bigger kicking was awesome. yeah Dan Bigger came on. <laughs> Uh, he started, and I, I like Dan Bigger as a 10. Uh, he's a very good starter, but not a good finisher of a match. So okay. to, ha to have him score like five points, or, you know, the first like five or so points, um, and then like he got hurt, and then, Re right. uh, and then Reese Patchell comes on, and he scores another 14 from his foot. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's, that's good work. That's just like, that's just doing good rugby. Right. Which is like, like, one thing that I feel is so important <clears throat> to the game is like the ability to, to just concede going for the try and taking a penalty kick in the opposing half and just getting three points. Yeah. Because obviously, like, these, it works. It works. It works. And and even then, like, even if you don't have a penalty, like, Wales Wales successfully attempted two drop goals this game. That's just that's six points. That's the difference between a win and a loss in a game like this. Yeah, and I mean it is the difference between because right. it was a four point you know difference. Yeah, yeah. Those those two drop goals like like the uh, that aggression and that that drive for the blood basically like that that's what won them this game. So, but it, towards the end of the second half, Australia did put a lot of they did put a lot of pressure on the Wales. It's they were just. They were just hammering the kicks into uh, Wales territory, just pounding them down their throats, getting those line outs. Like, what was the, what, it was like some odd, like 60% territory to uh, 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 Australia for the entire match. Um, hold on one second, I can pull that up for us. Yeah, let's, let's see if we can <laughs> pull that up. Let's uh, make sure we get that number right. So, but that, again, I mean, that, that's a big, like a big deal. Yeah, so like, it's yeah, it, so, so they almost pulled the upset. The almost pulled, oh not the upset, the uh, comeback. Territory was sixty three percent. Yeah, sixty three percent to and, Australia. And in the last ten minutes, it was about the same. It was fifty eight. So, yeah. like, given a standard deviation, like that's pretty much the same. Yeah. So really again, think about it. It's the, like, that's like it shows that they they couldn't finish. Yeah. 
And I mean, Australia is a good side, and they are a good team. But and and like they they're a strong defensive side, clearly, because because if we if we're specifically talking about those last ten minutes when when Australia I think had really had the momentum and the, and the pull for that game, um, their territory like they were they were controlling the territory for about sixty percent in the last ten, ten minutes, and then but their their possession was only forty percent. Mm, in, that, in that last 10 minutes. So, so like, they're defensively, like, they were doing a good job. Keeping whales. Ke keeping whales out of, out of their half. And, and so that, that is more stressful on, uh, uh, when you're on offense. Yeah, that's very Absolutely. true. Absolutely. Um, and so, like, and they, they, again, had the possession for more than 60% of that match. Yeah. So... So it's just one of those. It's it's one of those things that like Australia, they, they just didn't, they didn't, quite break the Welsh weaknesses in time. Fair enough. I, I it's it or or really enough. They didn't break them enough. So the next game we had was uh, Georgia versus Uruguay. Uh, you know, thirty three to seven, Georgia win. Again, it shows that Georgia is better it, uh, is better than some of these tier two nations. Right. But, it's, but at the same time, like Uruguay, like this is what people expected for Uruguay. They expected to lose. They they were expected to lose to their games to everybody by around this. And so, like I would I would say that the Fiji Uruguay game was was not necessarily Uruguay's like. High top tier performance, like like beating Fiji in a in a close one. It was more like Fiji coming down. I guess that's true. Um, I I mean this Georgia. I don't think this says anything powerful for the Georgia side. I, I don't think this is proof that they deserve to be a tier one nation or anything like that. But but I think it's. I mean it's a good win. Yeah, it's a good win for them. Moves them up the table. So, the final match, the one that I. The one that I've been saying this entire time, the team that I've been saying will break, will steal <laughs> hearts. They broke this. They broke the internet. This match broke the internet. I mean, let's be honest. They stole everybody's hearts, except ja for the Irish. Except for the Irish. But <laughs> Japan beat Ireland 19 to 12. I'm excited. I was. Ex I, I, let's be honest. I was expecting them to beat Scotland, not Ireland. But you know what? I don't care. Right now, Japan's on top of the, their pool. And with a 19 to 12 win, that's, that's insane. Mind blowing. And, and this, this is just like, it's another one of those things like, comes down to the kicks. Yeah, so Japan had six penalty kick opportunities. With, and it was like they were in the middle of the field, e like decently easy kicks, and they made four of them. So that's 12 points right there. You know, 12 points, which could have been potentially 18. Right, right, and and that like eighteen versus nineteen points, like they almost matched their score if they had been perfect on kicks, and and that's uh, with a try, like with their try, like like or it's it's that's, that's it. Kicks are just so important. Yeah, and like this is the second this is the second game like this week that we've been saying that kicks are important uh, that were important. Like again, Australia Wales kicks yeah. were important. This game yeah. kicks were important, and and that's it gave both those teams the wins. Like. I, if Ireland did not give away those penalties that were in pretty much in the middle of the field, like like right easy easier kicks to make than if they were given these penalties on the edges, you know, like if they, they gave the Japanese side like the ability to just kick the ball on the penalty kicks, and 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 take that percentage risk really, um, it's it was just it was good. It was yeah. Good. Do you think? So Johnny Sexton didn't play this game, mm -hmm. and I I think that's a that's a big factor why Ireland yeah didn't absolutely play well. because um, we were saying this with the prediction episode that Ireland does well if Conor Murray and Jonathan Sexton are both on the field and both on the same page yeah yeah um, John, John, like Jonathan Sexton like he he was he dealt with he was had a thumb injury in June or that that like. He played through and, and never really, I, I don't think that, I think that's still like kind of, it's, it's a mental thing. And then like his quad injury that he's been dealing with, like they pulled him because of 
injures, injuries. Like, and I'm sure he wasn't happy about it. Yeah, and I mean, in hindsight, it was a absolutely not high. now. But like, uh, I'm in, I'm wondering why didn't they just keep him on the 23 just to see in case we need to put you on the field. Like kind of, kind of with what with, with Scotland, where he just played minimal time. Right. Yeah. And I mean, like, I can see that. As long as he's able to distribute the ball and things like that, I yeah. think he'd be all right. Like, and just it, kick and. Yeah. Be a, be a kicker. Uh, although a quad injury, like I'm not sure if it was on his kicking side or not. That would be a bigger deal. But again, like but. having him on that on the field and being a presence in terms of distributing, that's a big one. Yeah. He's. I mean, he's. He's cap on understanding the game is just much higher than most. So like even even if he's just on the field and he's maybe not physically impacting the game as much as he could before, but just like decision wise making the impacts that he can make, like that would have been a big deal, especially with, with like Connor Murray is a great kicker, but he needs someone else. Yeah, he needs yeah, like he needs that I wouldn't say Batman to Robin, but you know, Star it's the Starsky to his Hutch. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's like he needs somebody there. And then here's another interesting thing. Mike Leach, the uh, captain for uh, for Japan. Yeah. He came off the bench. Yeah, he did. Um, but and and he put in the work you would have put in if even if he was a starter. And that's really important is that when when you're subs. Put in that level. But of imagine that, like having Mike Leach come on, the probably you know Japan's like world class player come on. That was that was insane. I think I think that's like I think that's a good thing, really. Yeah. I think it's it's it shows like to everyone else that the Japanese program they're not they're not messing around. Mm. They're they're out to to make what decisions they believe are best, and and. They're not afraid to make the decision, the hard decisions. Yeah. Um, and and that absolutely is a hard decision. So. But I will say, this match is probably the biggest win in Japanese like rugby history. Like oh, more see. so than the South Africa one, because again, they're beating the world number one at home in like the you know in their home like country on the in the World Cup. That's amazing. Yeah. See, for me, like I just. The South Africa victory, like, it just, it, I think it had a bigger impact in, in rugby culture just because, like, it was more unexpected. I mean, yeah, it is definitely unexpected. But. And, it, and it brought, well, I think, like, the win against South Africa, like, it's, it's what pulled them from being just kind of like, oh, yeah, it's Japan to, like, these guys, can, oh, yeah, these guys can, can pull some threats out. Yeah. And, and, and now they've had a professional league, like Japan's had a professional league, like a true professional league for about a decade now. Like, like now, now's the time where like you can really, you'll be really seeing them competing against top level competition. And, and it's, it, they're, at, they're starting to come into that, their own in that phase. So, yeah. Um, I, I just, uh, yeah, I'm pr I'm proud of Japan because again, like I said, they're my they're my team for yeah. I uh, I think that they shook up the pool this time around. Yeah, um, and and not to say like I'm disappointed with Scotland with how they played against Ireland initially, um, and I th I thought for sure Japan was going to beat Scotland after that match. I was like for sure that's but but again that's that's the last matchup of their their pool I believe. So like both those teams, like Scotland has time to recover um, from that. Yeah, and I think it, when it's, the biggest match now is that Scotland Japan. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, because if if Scotland beats Japan, then it comes down to points, right? The points differentials for the three yeah, teams and bonus points and yeah, and especially all that. But which would be insane if Japan becomes another team. To potentially win three games and not go to the uh, playoff stage. Yeah, that would be that would be because they did that happened to wow. them in yeah. the 2015 Cup. Mm -hmm. So imagine if having like a second time. Yeah, but like Japan, like if they beat Scotland, they're undefeated in the pool in my mind. I don't think they're gonna lose to anybody other than Scotland. If they if, if, if they, they were gonna lose to a if team. they were gonna lose to a team, I don't I don't think 
Their yeah, loss is going to come until they play Scotland. If you don't think a loss is going to pull it out. No, I don't. I don't think Samoa is going to beat Japan. Okay. Um, especially like they, 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 like Japan won the Pacific Cup this year. Like yeah, that's true. I, I and and Samoa plays in that cup. Yeah. And, and if if Samoa was going to prove that they could beat Japan, it would have been then, to me. Mm. Um, and and I didn't I didn't see it from them. I don't see it from them now. Uh, I I I think if anybody is going if anybody is going to beat Japan at this point, it will be Scotland. And honestly, right now, I want to see Japan be one in this pool. Yeah, because because that game, like that game just like it was amazing to watch. Like it was entertaining. It, it was, was emotional. Intense. It was tactical. Like they they proved like I think Japan looked like the better team. I, they looked like a tier one team. And you, did you see that they uh, they jumped up to number what eight in the world now? Eight. It's the highest they've ever been. Highest they've ever been. How awesome is that? That's phenomenal. I, I I'm happy to see another team finally like show consistency in in ability to compete with some higher teams. I think it's like, because it, obviously we were talking about in 2015, like they did well in the 2015 World Cup. Mm -hmm. You know, they they've won, they've won the Pacific Cup this year, like handily, really, and and now they've they've come in, into this this World Cup and beating the one of the favorites in the tournament. Yeah, the favorites to win the tournament, not just one the, of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not just the pool, like that in the entire tournament. Um, I think that's a bold. It, it was a bold statement for them. It but was. if they come number one, who would they? Would, would they? And they end up playing the number two seed of which group? Um, England, France, Argentina. Uh, so England, France, Argentina. So you think Japan would probably? It, so they'd probably play either France, Argentina. Yeah, one in, of those two. In my mind, yeah. I, I, I see England winning out of the pool. That's again, we're still getting into predictions because it's still early. Yeah, I mean, I know it's a little. I know I, this is all like a little bit of it's predictions. All, but it's all perspective at this point. But in my mind, if like, I, I could see Japan winning out and playing Argentina or France, and I couldn't. I could not. I, I don't think right at this point I could make an informed enough decision on. Yeah, Argentina. no, that's fair. I but, was just, I was just wondering. Because yeah. that would be pretty insane for them. Oh, absolutely. I could, but I, I'd love to see it. All right. And apart from the uh, World Cup, let's look a little bit more domestically with uh, this week's news. Yes. The MLR schedule dropped. I am ex excited. It's, it's awesome. Like I, we've so, got I'm so three, excited. Three, three new teams. We've got uh, Free Jacks. Atlanta. Atlanta and, and Old Glory. Yeah, and DC. So, so it's nice to see some Eastern teams. Um, or more Eastern teams, because like before it was really, it was New York, and then you could kind of count Louisiana as East, yeah, but Nola. like at the same time, like, yeah, like NOLA, NOLA, I still wouldn't say it's an Eastern program. So now, now we've got, we've got Atlanta, which I know being, being a South Carolina local and, and going to Clemson, like that, I'm absolutely going to go see some Atlanta games. Oh, for sure. Like I think one game I would like to go see is uh, Atlanta. I think they play uh, U Rugby United New York at yeah, home. Rooney. Yeah, they play Rooney at home, but you know it, it, that'll it's be only a an good hour match. away, and I think that's going to be a good match. Yeah, and uh, roughly roughly two, if I'm sure uh, Atlanta traffic, depending on the time <laughs> of the game. <laughs> I but like they play, you know, they play Rooney, they play Toronto at home. It's it's good matches, you to know. See. It's good. It's good home matches, and, yeah. and especially like for for us Clemson people. Like obviously, we like we've got a couple guys that have made their way up, and and Jason Dam, like he's now with Glendale. Atlanta. No, or no, with Atlanta. My bad. Yeah, from yeah, Glendale. Yeah. He was he he was when right, the right, new right. teams came in. Um, Their everybody expansion had, draft. Yeah, type it was thing. an expansion draft where people were pulled from other teams, and Jason was one of the guys in that draft, and now he's with. Rugby Atlanta, and and so like it'll be awesome for for us Clemson guys to go see somebody who's a Clemson alumni playing in the MLR, 
And, and like, local too. Re re locally, re realistically, like that's that's a great thing for us to see. So uh, in the Eastern Conference, like I want to see Atlanta do well. Yeah, I mean, and I think they'll do well because like there's that Atlanta life connection a yeah, little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, less than an hour, and I'm sure. I mean, they're playing at Life University Stadium anyway. Yeah, exactly. So and, I, and it's but it's just one of it's like it's a great it's a great thing for the southeast. Oh, for sure, especially. Especially for the southeast. Yeah, um, and then you've got you've got the Free Jacks in, in Boston. Yeah, so um, I don't know a whole lot about them. I don't I don't quite either. I know the the Free Jacks rugby program is pretty old. Yeah, that's um, what I've heard. Like it's it's it was established, and that's why they were they were provided an expansion spot to the MLR is because yeah. it was. An established rugby program that had history, kind of like Glendale. Like Glendale has yeah. history and has like a youth up program, you know. Like it's so. So I know that the Free Jacks, like that's they're an established rugby club in New England. But obviously, I don't know much about it because I didn't really follow much New England rugby, uh, being from South Carolina. I know that I know that the Free Jacks also do like to play. Uh, some Irish teams. So, like last year, they hosted a uh, they hosted a, a cup or a tournament where they hosted like Leinster to come over. I do remember they that. They played Munster and Ulster, yeah. which and Connacht, which is like pretty sweet. Yeah. I'm so I there's probably they probably got good talent and competition. Again, I don't know a whole lot about them, yeah. but, but I'm I'm excited to learn more. Yeah, I really want I want to see them succeed. Yeah. And then also the other new team, uh, DC Old Glory. Um, yeah, we've I, we've heard a lot about them recently because well the so Old Glory uh, last year came down to one of the they came Clemson down, rugby matches. Yeah, they went they came down to see Clemson Arc Arc State Arkansas State. Yeah, and and so um, they gave like a speech to the players and our, our former coach and and we're kind of just like giving us a picture of what they really are and, and what like they, they gave want us like a, yeah exactly what their personality the, the, right. what kind of team they want to be and and so it was it's it was kind of nice to to see like that that they're they've worked really hard on recruiting they've traveled ev like around trying to get find people they want for their roster and build a good roster yeah and so, i think that they've they started to build a a, a, a solid roster and the cool thing about them is that they did a lot of focus on let's try to sign uh, DC guys. Yeah, they did want they were like um, one of one of the players uh, they talked to from Clemson last year, uh, Drew Dommel. Yeah. Um, he's from DC originally, and they definitely they had great conversations with him. Um, and and so like that's that's one of those things that they they really wanted local rugby and lo local talent that had started ground up to really build the core part of their program um, which is which is really cool um, I I'm a, all about uh, working on local talent and building local talent so I, I would love I, I can't wait to see what they bring so in the rest of the Eastern Conference do you think NOLA Toronto or Rugby United have are they going to improve at all? Because, I mean, Rugby United New York, they got Bastaro now. So they now have yeah. Ben Foden and Matteo Bastaro. I think, I think um, Rooney's taking the approach of, of bringing some great talent to build up the players around them. And I think that's a great approach. And I think um, it'll help them. Because Ben Foden, like, let's be honest, he is not at the levels he was. Yeah, he used to be. Yeah. yeah. But he's got the experience, he's got the knowledge, and he had, like, people recognize that name and being like, oh, he was a great player, you know? It's, it's one of those things that he, he brings in so much to the program. And that organization yeah. is very professional. So it, last, it is. last summer, I was able to go to see them versus uh, NOLA, and they were, again, very, it was a very professional, like, environment, and you know, I got to see a little bit backstage of that, of uh, what was going on, like in the locker room and things. And they run a very tight ship, and seeing that is really cool. And I, I think they, I think Rooney could do well this season, especially for this Eastern Conference. Absolutely, and uh, with with who they've brought in, um, 
And now I think they have real time to, to gel. Yeah. I, I think last season, because uh, they were new last year, or for this past season, uh, yeah. and they were still kind of trying to figure out their image and figure out some of the other teams in, in the MLR. Um, and this really, now, now I think they've, they've had a year under their belt. They know what to expect from some of these other programs. And they're, they're ready. They're ready. So let's move on to the Western Conference. So the Western Conference is consisted of Austin Elite, Houston Sabercats, San Diego Legion, uh, Glendale, Utah Warriors, and then the two-time two -time champions. champions, the Seattle Seawolves. So, what, do you have anything really to say about these teams? Um, obviously, uh, uh, being from Clemson, or being in Clemson, and, yeah. and being uh, involved with the Clemson rugby program um, for a few years, I want to see Glendale do well. Yeah. Um, with, that, uh, with that partnership, <coughs> it's, it's exciting for us and, and them to, to build a relationship with a professional program. And even though they're out in Colorado, like, I, I think relationships can o overscale distance with, with the modern technology and, and what we have at our disposal. Um, and so that, I, I want to see them do better than they did last year. Um, I want to see them make, make the finals. Uh, and, and that's, I think, realistic for them. Because they, they did it the first year. Yeah, and I think all... I mean, like all bias aside, I think that these, the you know, Glendale, have the profession, professionalism, the upbringing, like the academy side, and the, and even the talent to to do it, to do it, to put themselves in, you Absolutely. know, into the uh, finals for the Western Conference, and uh, like the Western Conference finals, and even go to the championship final. Absolutely. I think that they have the opportunity to do that. Um, so, but do you think that's a, what do you think is going to probably be the most improved team out of those Western Conference? Most improved? I'm saying Austin. I was about to say Austin has. I think on this side of the table, Austin has the most room to grow. Right. Um, and and I think they can grow a lot. I, I expect them to because they, they. I mean, they've been in the in the uh, MLR since the beginning. They weren't an expansion. They've got, they, they have the experience over these new teams. Obviously, uh, that's, uh, all the new teams are on the other side of the conference, but, or in the other conference. But I, it's just one of those, like, it's, it's something that they've, they've got the experience. They've got the understanding. Um, they, they should be looking at kind of building their own style and building their own identity. And I don't think they've done that as much in the previous years, but I think mm -hmm. they can do it this year. So I think, uh, I don't necessarily think that they will, they 100% they will be the best team to, in, in, in skill growth, mm -hmm. but I think they definitely have one of the most potential growths. And another team I think that could do really, really well this season is Houston Sabercats. Ah, that's some bias. <laughs> well, yeah, I they mean. They do, they definitely can be great. But I, I just, the, for those who don't know, CJ, would you like to explain why you root for the Houston Sabercats? Well, I mean, my dad is, does live in Houston. Yeah. And I don't know. I like, I like Houston. <laughs> like, I also like Glendale. There's some family ties there. There's a little, there's a little there's bit. I like, I like Houston. I like, the, I like the team. Like, when the MLR first came up, I, you know, I did a little bit of research, and I liked Houston. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I think... I think that they could go to the playoffs this year. Like, wow. I think it could, they could go to the playoffs. Yeah, I, it's I, half the teams from each conference make it. Um, so all you need to do is be in the top half. But in which, that Western Conference, that is tough. That I was about to say, because the, the Western Conference, like, obviously you've got three new teams on the Eastern Conference. So you can't say the Eastern Conference has dominated uh, rugby in the MLR for the last two years. But you can genuinely say, like, your Western Conference has your two-time champion in it. It has a finalist in it. Two finalists. Two finalists in it. And, it, or like, and it's, it's, there are teams that you look at in the Western Conference and you're like, man, they really put the Giants together. I mean, it, it is, it's, again, I, I, like I said, I, Houston, they could, they could be a playoff 
But at the end, they have to be really, really they well They have coached. to grow. They, they have, have a lot to be of open to trying new things. And they do have a new coach. So they do. They do have a new coach. Their new coach, like when, I bet once he comes in there, he's going to be able to figure out things mm -hmm. and sort them out. I, I think uh, some of the best, best things you can do for a program is bring in new perspectives. And, and Austin should do it. Uh, Houston is doing it. Yeah. Like it's, it's, that, it's something that when you get another, another view of the game, it makes you better because now you can see the game in two different lights. True. Um, yeah, so I, I, I touched on it a little bit, um, but how the MLR Championship Series is uh, planned, mm -hmm. um, we should go over some of that because it's different. Yeah, than, it's a brand new, yeah, years. it's brand new this year. Which makes sense because now there's 12 teams. So, so it's this season, the way they wanted to do it is that they have two conferences, Eastern Conference and a Western Conference. And we already told you kind of, kind of a little bit about the teams from each side. So 12 teams, there's 96 regular season games, th five playoff games. Each team has to play uh, 10 conference games and then six non-conference games. Right. So it's, it's a 16-week season. Which or is... Like, not including... Playoffs. Right, which is, I mean, that's long. That's long. That's rough. That's a lot of rugby. That's a lot of rugby, and I'm happy about that. Oh, I'm happy about that. <laughs> but do you but think I, it's such gonna, a long season is going to kind of play I, some? It'll it's absolutely to the players. It'll absolutely play a role in in performance. I think teams that have a great core 15 or a great core 23 in their program um, will not do as well as teams that have a great core 30 in depth into their, into their uh, other like developmental sides. Right. Because, because when you get into week 12, like, and you've played the same 23, or, or as close to the same 23 as you can because of like injuries happen. So like when, you, when you're getting into week 13, 14, 15, and if more injuries come in, or if, if players get pulled up to play international, yeah. Like, the the depth you're pulling up from your from your feeder teams and your feeder programs, like, they have to be able to compete at the level of the MLR to to continue a, a successful program. Yeah, and that's why, like, that's what I think Seattle was, did last year is they like they performed just as well at the end of the season and as they did at the beginning, and it wasn't necessarily the same 23 guys on the field. So, yeah, consistency is definitely going to have to be the main yeah. thing for this season. Right. And then when we talk about playoffs, each conference gets three playoff teams. The, first, the, two, the second and the third seed play each other in essentially what is like a, a wild card quarterfinal, I guess. And yeah. then the first, team, and then the first seed team gets like a bye week. Right. So it's um, kind of similar it, to like the, football. Yeah, um, it's it's similar. It's smaller scale. Right. Yeah. Um, a lot smaller. Right. Uh, I, I, I'm honestly shocked that they picked a six team, six team playoff over an eight team playoff because you have twelve teams now. Um, I think it's it's legitimate enough to leave four teams out and keep eight teams on. Um, and I know like oh like that seems like a big percentage, mm -hmm. but. But like that, I think that one seed advantage is just insane. It's so powerful. And like, like we said, oof. a sixteen a sixteen game season, and then you get that one bye week. Like you get you, you and like not only are you one more game rested, but the other team is one, one more one game, more game attrition. Higher. Like that, yeah, that like attrition factor. Right, and so it's like. That 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 missing game for them, that that buy game for them, like, is it's so heavily favoring that first seed that I would I almost am surprised they didn't do a four four seeds on the west, four seeds on the east, and just like make that game even, obviously, and do like a one four seed, two three seed. And I get it, you've only got twelve teams right now for that. Ability. So, like, I get, I get why you want 50% to make it because that makes a higher standard for who gets in. 
And I also like that they're rewarding the dominant teams. Right, but I mean, even you, you still get a reward if, if you're playing the fourth seed. Yeah, it's, I guess. It's much less stressful when, when you're preparing for a team that you're confident you can beat. Yeah, I, mean, I, am, I know that, but the, also it is the MLR. Mm -hmm. And kind of like the cool thing about the MLR is that the talent and like the every team has a chance to beat each other mm -hmm. every single week. So that's also got to be like a little bit like if you're that number one team, like that number four team is still pretty good and they could come after you. That's true. Well, I, I realistically to me, um, I, I just I don't know. I could have seen a 14 playoff again or, or an 18 playoff. Six just I, I don't picture six as as almost even. Yeah, it's a little weird. It's it's because it, I don't know. That's a, that's a personal preference thing. Like even uh, it's it's not rugby um, for uh, the Americans for college football. Um, there's always the discussion of whether it should be a fourteen playoff, a fourteen playoff, or an eighteen playoff, or a six, sixteen sixty four, or even a sixty four yeah. team but, playoff, but, yeah. which would be ridiculous. But but like it's it's they nobody very rarely do you hear somebody argue for a six team playoff, and they have so many more teams than than the MLR does, and and it's it's because of that factor of you're giving those top two teams in the in the country uh, even more than really is fair almost. Like yes, you worked and you earned that first seed and that's why you should get an easier game. But having no game at all, mm, okay. to me that just seems like you're, you're allowing for so much more like preparation and, and recovery for, for a program that like it's, it to me heavily favors your one seed. And so I, I get it. I, I understand. Um, I just would love to hear more behind the reasoning um, on why they selected this format. Well, maybe we'll, find, maybe we'll hear a reasoning later on in the season. Yeah. Or maybe, like, well, I mean, it's the first time that they're doing this uh, experimental 16 playoff with these guys. So we'll see what, how, how yeah. it pans out. But, like, Absolutely again, that's a lot of time, you know. Yeah. Like the first game's, you know, February 8th, and the last game is in May. You know, last day almost last like, season game. Last season game is like the end of like in May. Well, well, the uh, championship series takes takes 